So to get started properly, my name is Amanda Fallis. I'm an archivist at the City Archives. I recognize many of you from past programs. Um, we're really excited to be featuring Jonathan Reynolds of Louisiana Appleseed today to give a presentation on Ayers property and all the ins and outs of that. Uh, oftentimes it does overlap with materials that you may be doing using for genealogy or archival research. So we're like really happy that like we see him using our phone book from time to time to like track people down. It's really cool. But with that being said, um, I am going to share this the spreadsheet and I'm gonna hand this over to Jonathan. So let's get you situated on the camera and then we'll share the screen. Hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Jonathan Reynolds. I am uh, the heirs property staff attorney. <laughs> good afternoon. <laughs> well, I just got you. okay. Good afternoon, everybody. I've, I've been corrected by the studio audience already. <laughs> But good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jonathan Reynolds. I'm the Ayers Property Staff Attorney for Louisiana Appleseed. Uh, and we are here today to talk about Ayers Property. But we're also going to not only just talk about Ayers Property, we're going to give you guys uh, the basics of it, the basic general idea. But then we're also going to talk about different resources available at the New Orleans Public Library within the system you can use to do your own heirs property research. One of the, the biggest issues that we're gonna talk about is it's a huge pie to eat. It's a huge cake to eat. There's, uh, there might be families that have generations of people who own the same piece of property. And the first step to resolving that is just getting started. Part of getting started is starting with your family tree. So I'm gonna walk through uh, different resources that you can use to build out your family tree and find uh, different relatives, different properties that are already within your family. Louisiana Appleseed, we're actually not the only Appleseed. It's a network of different independently run Appleseeds. It's in a few different states, also even one in Mexico. The Louisiana Appleseed branch was started in 2007. It was mostly in response to Hurricane Katrina. We realized that a lot of people were having trouble uh, recovering from Katrina, and we realized that one of those major issues was due to Ayers property. So that's pretty much where we're coming from. That's why we exist. Uh, different apple seeds in different uh, parts of the country, we don't all focus on Ayers property. Some apple seeds might focus on criminal justice. Some might focus on education. It just depends on what the major issues are in that specific state. But we've decided in Louisiana to focus on heirs property as one of our major issues. And we do some other issues also, but this is our major issue right here. When we're, when we're talking about heirs property, one of the first things we're going to talk about is the concept of will. I don't know how many people have their wills done. Uh, as far as our studio audience, do you guys all have your wills done? No? We're going to get into that. But uh, one of the big questions are, are is what's a will? A will is a document that you you have and it actually tells how you want your property to actually go who do you want it to go to at the time of your death we have two different types of wills in the state of louisiana we have oligraphic wills and notarial wills uh notarial will is what most of us think about when we think about a will that's where it's you a notary and two witnesses uh, there are very strict uh, requirements for a notarial will in the state of Louisiana, and if these requirements aren't followed, it's considered null and void. I'm not going to necessarily go into the requirements, but the basic requirements are must be signed by the testator, must be signed by two witnesses, must be notarized, must be, must be signed on each page by the, 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 by the person making the will, and must be dated. Uh, another thing that comes up in the state of Louisiana Let's say that you're in an instance where maybe your, uh, your, your demise is imminent, where you have the option to handwrite a will, and that's called an oligraphic will. Oligraphic will, don't necessarily recommend it, but there are instances where it's the best you can do. Maybe you don't have access to a lawyer. You don't have access to a notary. Uh, maybe time is of the essence. And the basic requirements for an oligraphic will would be completely handwritten by the person making the will, uh, signed and dated. The issue with an oligraphic will is obviously it's going to be much more uh, available to be challenged, to be overturned. So that's why I don't necessarily recommend that people rely on an oligraphic will. Not to mention the idea of 
Uh, sometimes in holographic wills, people do things that are not necessarily allowed in the process of law. So I do recommend that everybody, when they get their wills done, that they actually go to a notary or a lawyer who is uh, very knowledgeable about writing wills. What happens if you die or one of your relatives dies and they don't have a will? That's what we call in Louisiana, that we, that would, that's what we call kind of estate. We actually have a rule of succession on how your property is actually divided. Should you uh, pass without a will? Uh, the rules are slightly different, whether it be separate property or, uh, uh, or community property, the rules are slightly different, but I'll give you guys the basics. When somebody dies and they don't have a will, uh, somewhat obviously intuitively, the first line of succession would be your descendants. Uh, should the person have no descendants, the second line would be uh, parents and siblings. There's a little bit of nuance with that. Should the person not have parents and siblings, a surviving spouse? And then that's when we get into the whole big family tree. If a person doesn't have any things, that's where we get into like a Brewster's Millions type situation where you have a cousin that you might have never met, a uh, second cousin, third cousin, things like that. So that's the basic operation. If you don't have a will and you die in test state, what happens, I brought up the idea of, I don't know if you guys remember that old Richard Pryor movie, Brewster's Millions. What happens in a scenario like that, where you might have a bunch of cousins, you might have a bunch of relatives who all own this piece of property together. These people, uh, sometimes it's people more remote. We're going to actually go through a quick exercise about this. And that leads to the concept of we might have heirs property. There's a lot of words on the screen, so I don't expect everybody to read that. But basically, heirs property is a situation. Uh, the most simplest would be mama dies, grandmama dies. Now it's uh, all of her children own the property. Uh, maybe one of the children is predeceased, and now the children's children inherit the property. I'm not going to go into all the legal terms about that, but that's a general idea. And hopefully this next slide is going to illuminate the situation more. No, no, no. We're going to do this first. Why does heirs' property persist? Why don't people avoid this very tenuous form of ownership? One of the reasons is lawyers are expensive. Notaries are expensive. The entire process is expensive. It's expensive going in to get a will, but it's even more expensive on the back end after a few generations have passed to even clean up something like this. It gets exponentially more difficult. What's another reason uh, that people might not have a will? Even people who can afford wills sometimes, even people who can afford proper estate planning, proper succession planning, sometimes still don't do it. Why is that? Historic disenfranchisement and distrust of the legal process. It's a really real thing. Uh, some people would say in modern times, it's not that big of an issue, but at one point it was a valid strategy for people to obscure their ownership in these kind of ways to protect their property. I'd say it's not necessarily like that anymore, but through generations, the same way that the property stayed in the family through generations, this belief has also stayed in the family through generations. And then the third thing, once you get all these three things out of the way, I've encountered uh, people who are property owners who may be elderly or approaching elderly, and they see it as an issue not for them, but an issue for the next generation to deal with. One of the reasons why I'm here is I'm here representing Louisiana Appleseed, obviously, but we also have a relationship with Acadiana Legal Services and Southeast Louisiana Legal Services, where for people who are low income or elderly, we're willing to do the wills and the basic succession and estate planning for them for free, where we would provide the attorneys. Also for people who are elderly or low income, who find themselves who uh, own heirs property, we're actually also willing to help them go through the succession that may, might have not been closed so that they can have their name added to the title and figure out what they're gonna do with their property. So what we have here, is a simple and a complex family tree. And I'm gonna walk through this simple family tree just to show you guys how quickly heirs property can become a problem. Let's say we have Alex and Martha. They bought a piece of property in 1950. They're the 100% owners. One day, Alex and Martha are deceased. And then they have their children, Belinda and Bessie. 
who would normally inherit the property, Belinda's deceased, Bessie's deceased. Now Belinda has two children, Jean and Jock. Bessie has three children, Jules, Josephine, and Jared. Jean is deceased. Now she has her three children, Sally, Saul, and Sophie. Sophie has her two children. Sophie is deceased. Sophie has Yvonne and Ignatius. And on the other branch of the family, Josephine is deceased. And she has Tina and Tony. Now we're left with a piece of property after generations, after a few decades. This is only one, two, three, four, five generations. And now we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine co-owners. Each of these co-owners own in different percentages. Let's say that Jared actually lives on the property, takes care of the property. Jared is in a situation where he owns a piece of property with eight other people. Uh, maybe Jared has met his niece and his nephew, Tina and, Tina and Tony. Obviously, most likely, Jared has met his sister, Jules. Jared might have met his cousin, Jock. But there is a potential that Jared has never met Yvonne, Ignatius, Saul, Sally, and yet he's in a situation where he lives in this house. He takes care of this house. He's probably the only person who pays taxes on this house. And yet he has eight other co-owners, four of which he probably has never even met before. This leads to a situation where Jared is in a very tenuous situation with this house. It's less tenuous, let's say, if it's in a rural area where it's a, a piece of land that might be acres, you know, it might be 20, 15, however many acres, that's amenable to being uh, partitioned, amenable to being divided. But there's no realistic way for nine people to split a house at this point. So Jared's in a very uh, tenuous situation. Uh, and that's only after four or five generations. And I also have up here a family tree of the royal, the English British royal family. And we can see how quickly things can spiral from Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip's death to all these different people who may or may not have an interest at this point. And this is with a, a billionaire family right here. So these uh, issues exist in small families. Uh, it exists in families with less resources, also exist in large families, and also exist in families with large resources. It's always an issue to be cognizant of. Uh, typically, uh, larger, more wealthy families might have more resources to deal with this, but this can happen in any family. So now that we have this issue and it's already going on, what would this family do to actually go about clearing their title and figuring this issue out. One of the things about clearing title, once you, that's why we would like for you guys to get wills and get proper succession in the state planning is to prevent these type of things before they happen. But once you're in this situation, it can be very time consuming and expensive to clear it up. One of the things you guys can do to speed up the process when you go to talk to your attorney or you're planning it with your family is to start your family tree. And the first thing you're gonna do to start this process is once you identify the property that you're trying to figure out, that you're trying to clear the title to, is there's your parish assessor and your parish assessor's office is gonna have a document. We, some people refer to it as a tax card, but that's from, from the old days where it was a physical document. Uh, let's say you go, you're in Orleans Parish, you can go to the Orleans Parish Tax Assessor's website and that's where your actual research would start. That's gonna, I think we're gonna go over that a little bit later, the different things that are gonna be on your tax card. Uh, the second thing you would like to look at is your county or parish uh, clerk of court property division. That's gonna have the actual will, not the wills, different documents that convey ownership. It could be a little bit daunting for uh, people who don't do this all the time to actually navigate through the actual chain of title, but most county assessors, most uh, parish assessors are at least willing to help you from your tax card find your, uh, your it was called a hard deed, the actual deed where this piece of property came into the family. Most assessor's offices will actually help you find that because it's normally an annotation on your tax card from the assessor. Where there are different tools, that you can use to build your family tree. We're gonna go into a lot of this in some detail. Online census records, 
affidavits of airship that's uh, in the civil courts. Uh, another thing would be archival newspapers, archival phone books, uh, findthegrave.com, skip trace. That's a little bit beyond uh, the resources that most everyday people are going to have. But these are tools that your lawyers, that your uh, professionals are going to use to actually help you clear your title. Orleans Parish Tax Assessor. Since we're doing this for the Orleans Parish Library Branch, the Orleans Parish Tax Assessor has a great amount of valuable tools that you can use to start your family tree, to start clearing the title on your property. When you go to the Orleans Parish Assessor's Office, there is a link that you can put where you can put in your last name, your first name, or the person who owns the actual property, the person who's the owner of record. Let's say you don't necessarily know who the owner of record is, but you have an address. You can also look up it, look it up through the address. Let's say you don't know what the address is. Certain properties have been, uh, it's obscure what the actual address is. Some properties actually do not have an address, even in an urban parish like New Orleans. In more rural parishes, it's very common for uh, properties to not have addresses. Let's say you can't find it through the owner of record's name. You might not remember your great, great, great grandparents' name or which one of them actually owned it or how it's listed in the parish assessor's office. You might not remember what the address is. The property might not have an address. What you can do is there's also a map feature where in this map feature, you can find a property that does have an address or does have a known owner. And then you can navigate to your property and click on it. And it's going to give you a wealth of data that you can use to start your family tree, to start the process of clearing your title. One of uh, the questions we get a lot specifically relates to taxes. The idea of a person like in a Jarrett type situation where he lives on the property, he takes care of the property, he pays the taxes on the property. A question that comes up a lot is, well, does Jared own the property? Jared owns an in division with all of his other relatives' this property. Uh, I've heard people ask, they, they, they might ask, well, if I pay the taxes on it, doesn't that not mean that I own the property separate from my relatives? No. In the state of Louisiana, when a co-owner pays taxes or does any sort of uh, exercise of their ownership over the property, it's seen as being done on behalf of all the other co-owners. It's possible to have prescription against uh, co-owners. It's uh, in theory. I've never actually seen it work. But uh, in theory, when you own this property, just because you live on the property, just because you're the person taking care of the property, just because you're the person paying taxes on the property, does not give you the right to exclude your other co-owners. Uh, the reason why I put that after the assessor slide is because that's a, one of the major questions that people like to ask, and I'm just getting it out of the way right now. <laughs> Challenges to heirs, property owners, reasons that you might not want to own a piece of property like this. You run the risk of, we talked about taxes. You run the risk of when you have nine people, 10 people own a house, own a smaller piece of property, Oh, it comes down to, and let's say no one lives in the property. No one's incentivized to pay the taxes. No one is incentivized to fix the house up. So you come into these issues where the house is behind on taxes. Now it's up for sheriff. So you come into these issues where the house might have become blighted. The property might have become blighted. So it's accumulated fines throughout, uh, throughout the decades. And now you're in a situation where it's also at being up for sale by the city. Then there's also the idea of now that you have nine people who own it, some people who are more removed from the property, some people who have less of a relationship to the property in the state of Louisiana, you can't force this person to own the property with you. This person at any moment could decide that they don't want to own the property with you anymore and force a partition. Not necessarily bad in uh, every instance. Uh, some families are more reasonable than others where they could have the issue of a family buyout where the family is allowed to buy this person out. But what normally happens is the property could be going go, be forced to a partition cell. And that's particularly bothersome in that the remaining family members who don't want to sell might not be the highest bidders at this partition cell. And they could lose the property for a fraction of what it's worth. The other issue that comes up when you own property uh, in the heirs property format is the idea of, whose responsibility are the repairs, whose responsibilities are any sort of outstanding debt to the property, whose responsibility are these things. 
And it's similar to with taxes. When you have this many people who own the property, there's this tendency for either one person to do everything or, or everyone else to just look and go, I don't want to deal with this. So in these instances, I try to convey to people, specifically uh, elderly people who are landowners, one of the reasons why they need to take care of this is to prevent your family from having to go through this sort of situation and potentially lose the property. Some landowners are more amenable to this logic than others. The second piece of logic that I like to give people is it doesn't only affect your family, it also affects your community. There are challenges that come up in the community in these situations. One of the biggest challenges are now we have these properties, specifically in Orleans Parish. I live in uh, the Ninth Ward, the Bunny Friend neighborhood. Uh, my neighborhood was completely destroyed by Hurricane Katrina. It was completely underwater, literally underwater, not just the mortgage. And one of the issues that we had is, so like on my block in 2004, on my block in 2004, there might have been uh, there was a house and there was a house every in every in every lot. There's maybe 20 people on each side. So 40, 60, 80 families lived on this block at one point. That's a little bit high. Let's say 60 families lived on this block at one point. Here we are uh, over 15 years removed from Hurricane Katrina. Right now on my block, there are maybe out of 60, there are maybe 15 families. And one of the reasons why that is, why my neighborhood is still having trouble recovering, are a lot of these properties are now heirs' property. So even if any three of you wanted to get together and get the money together and try and buy one of these properties, these properties are functionally out of commerce because they have uh, owners who are all over the country, have owners who are might be deceased, you just have to track down, they're functionally out of commerce. It's actually uh, harmful to the neighborhood. A lot of these properties are, uh, they're blighted now, they're abandoned, they're in disrepair, and there's really no solid way for these properties to come easily come back into commerce. So that's one of the things I like to impress upon people. This doesn't only affect your family, it also affects the community that you own property in and that you love and it affects your neighbors also going forward. Now we're going to talk about the relationship. What, 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 what can you guys do to start the process even before you go to a lawyer, even before you go to some other sort of professional? What can you do on your own through the resources available at the Orleans Parish Library to start cleaning up your property, figuring out what the situation is? There, uh, there are in-person resources, and I'm going to go through them separately. But the major categories of in-person resources that are available at the library are newspapers, obituary and death records, indexes, marriage indexes, ancestry. I put an asterisk by that because it's sort of a computer resource, phone directories, parish and city directories. We're going to go through these things and the sort of information that you can find using these resources. And I'm actually going to give you guys an example using my own family of different resources I found last week looking through this stuff. Newspapers, newspapers are great. You can actually access uh, the Times-Picayune going back to probably even like the 1700s. I didn't even know Times-Picayune was around that long, but it's 1837. You can go back to the Times-Picayune and I think there was a predecessor newspaper. There, there are so many newspaper uh, articles that you can look at online. When I first started doing this, I didn't have access to online newspapers. I had to actually go and use microfilm. I had to use the actual, not, it's not a Dewey Decimal System, but I'm gonna call it a Dewey Decimal System. I had to go to a big box with cards in it and go through the cards and then go to another big cabinet and pull out this thing that looks, I don't, I don't even know how to, if you're under 40, I don't even know how to describe it to you. But it's literally like film from a camera that's developed and you put it in this machine that I'm showing you here. And it shows you and you just scroll through the newspaper pages and pages and pages. What is it doing? And it's just pages and pages and pages. We now have online newspapers where these are so easy and fast to search through. 
there was something I looked up maybe 10 years ago, and it took me a week to find it, this news article from the 1980s. Uh, now I, I re-remembered it. I had to go back and rework a paper I was working on, and it took me maybe 10 minutes to find it on the computer. So this is a very powerful resource that you guys have at your disposal. We have the Times Picayune, uh, I believe through the website, you also have access to different other papers throughout the Southeast region of the United States. What sort of information can you find in a newspaper that is gonna be helpful to your, uh, your chain of title search, your uh, building your family tree? Uh, this is just, for instance, newspapers are almost infinite amounts of information. You might be able to find uh, a notice of when one of your relatives graduated from high school or university. You might be able to find marriage notices. You might find obituaries. You might find property transfers. Uh, or sometimes it might just be like one of your cousins was interviewed about an award that they won, and it mentions other people in the family. Newspapers are a great uh, resource, and they're actually one of my favorites. That you get a lot of information, and it's actually really fun going through them. Obituaries. I believe at the library there are uh, obituary indexes. This is also available online. And I, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think you guys also have access where folks can order the obituaries if it's something yeah. that's indexed. Yeah, on our website, um, there's instructions for how to order things remotely if you aren't able to come in or you don't have access to the databases. Mm -hmm. So these are great uh, when you go through the obituary indexes. There's normally a little bit of information. I think I might have one of the indexes next, but uh, information you can generally get from an actual obituary that you get after you go through the index and you order the obituary or you find it on a different site. Normally, it's going to be a link to, not a link, it's going to be a reference to a newspaper article. And then you can use the newspaper search to find that obituary. Uh, information that you commonly can find in an obituary, date of birth, date of death. Uh, this is what you can actually find in the index, obituary, citation, relatives, occupation, residence, phone books. Phone books are a lot of people who do, what, at least what I used to do, they thought it was a little bit overkill that I use phone books. And I've been able to solve some stone cold whodunits through telephone directories. Literally every year, I guess some people might be younger. We're in the mobile phone era. You guys, some of you guys might not even know what a phone book is, but it's a thing that used to be delivered to our house every year. And it'd be what people said their address was, what people said that their phone number was. I remember uh, I had an issue maybe five years ago. It was a lawyer who owned the property and all of his mail though, and all of the property records were to his office. His office no longer exists. It's a building that no longer exists. So one of the things I had to do was actually find more information on what was in this, what was in this spot. Like where, like the, if you go long enough, far enough down the train, I'm going to get into maps and all that stuff like that. Even the street names change sometimes. Uh, you know, famously, we've had some street name changes in the last 10 years in New Orleans. So one of the ways I was able to track this down was through phone book searches. So one of the best things with the phone book search is you can tell what year a person lived in a specific, uh, at least claimed to live in a specific address, what year did a business have a specific address, when did that start, when did it stop? And that's the thing you can do through a phone book search. Marriage records. The Orleans Parish also has marriage record indexes. These are for further back, uh, for more recent uh, marriages. Uh, that's going to be like a state thing. Uh, you have to go through the state for these. Uh, I forget the name of the department. But at the library, if you go back far enough, if you and I was thinking that this would not be necessarily relevant since the dates are so far back. But literally one of our in-house audience members showed me a document and it was in the 1800s. And I was like, OK, I guess it's very relevant. Things that you can find from a marriage record, you could find a. Uh, a maiden name, you can find the spouse's name, date of marriage, date of birth. And a thing that comes up is the idea of when I'm looking at these sort of documents, I also make a note of who the witnesses are, because you're probably going to see those names again. A lot of time, witnesses are also relatives. So very important to keep track of. 
The library also has uh, archival uh, records, uh, civil and criminal court records. Uh, and these are very relevant, 1920, 19, 1926, 1931. And the civil records, uh, information that you can find, uh, divorces, adoptions. Adoptions are very important. That's a thing we always have to check for when we're doing this kind of thing. Uh, child support notices give you information and the person's mailing address. Uh, criminal records have things that don't necessarily seem relevant at the beginning of your search. Like date of birth is always relevant. Parish of residence, you're not, sometimes you're not really sure why that's relevant, but it does come up. And presumed race, that actually is a thing if you're going far enough back, especially in Louisiana, where it is of relevance to your family tree to uh, figuring out certain issues you might come along. This is uh, a wonderful resource that I'm actually with one of our uh, in-house audience members we're going to talk about later. Deed facts. I don't know how far back does deed facts go. It's um, I believe what we have upstairs may be to the eighties. Eighties, so not far enough back. Is it? Do you know if there are like a microfilm version of it that so goes? From further? my understanding, there's not, and I don't think there's a database at this mm. at this juncture right now. Um, I can look into that and I can email everybody who's attended today with what I find out. And so the beauty of deed facts is it's uh, basically information that you could also find in a newspaper, but it's condensed where it's just the property transfers in a specific parish. And the information it's going to give you, it's going to, uh, uh, I made a mistake on that. It's going to give you the information that you're going to be able to get from a deed facts is who was the buyer, who was the seller, what was the address? And I believe it also tells you uh, approximately where the property is through uh, if you know how to read all that kind of stuff. Also, my favorite, uh, I guess most of you guys' favorites also since you're here on Zoom, uh, online resources. The online resources are awesome. They are pretty amazing and they're fun to use. There's the uh, Ancestry Library Edition. We're not really going to cover that that much. Even though the online, the, the Ancestry Library Edition, I have it under online resources. Currently, it's only available within the library. However, a lot of the information that you're actually able to get from Ancestry, you can also get in Heritage Quest online. And we're going to delve into that more deeply. There are some extra features as far as I believe, like maybe building a family tree and actually helping you organize the information that's available in Ancestry. It's not available in Heritage Quest. But I think uh, most of the information, the documents are actually also on Heritage Quest. There's also Fold3, newspapers.com, also uh, Times Picayune uh, archives and Sanborn maps. So we're going to get into the weeds a little bit. So bear with me for a second. Fold3. Fold3 is military records. Uh, I believe it's a Korean War, Vietnam War, uh, World War II, World War I, a bunch of wars that have been declassified and it's information that you can get on your family members. We're gonna really get into this. This is a personal thing. Uh, let's see, Barlow Reynolds. Barlow Reynolds is my grandfather's father. Yes, might be my grandfather's grandfather. No, grandfather's father, Barlow Reynolds. Me and my mom, uh, we were recently, uh, one of my relatives recently passed and we were at the cemetery where most of my family is buried, where most of the Reynolds are buried. And I saw a tombstone, it was Barlow Reynolds. And I remember my grandfather, when he was a kid, he would always talk about his father, Bartow. And I was like, I think this is my grandfather's father's tombstone. And my mom was like, that's not him, that's somebody else. That Bar his name was not Barlow because my grandma, my mom's actually met this guy. She's like, that's not him. But let's see, when you go to fold three, can you guys, hopefully you guys can see this video. This is just how simple the search works on most of these online resources. This is so much better than what we had before. And so this is just me searching for Barlow Reynolds and I'm looking, I'm thinking that's not him. That's not Bar that's Barlow Reynolds. I'm looking at the States. Like, no, never lived in Idaho. He was not British. He was not in the Royal Air Force. Barlow Reynolds, World War I. Okay, where did he live? Crestview, Florida. I have relatives in Crestview, Florida. That's where I saw this tombstone, Crestview, Florida. This might be the guy. 
What's his mom? His contact's name is Nivy Reynolds. I don't know a Nivy Reynolds. I don't know a Nivy Reynolds. And now this is the actual manifest of him being shipped out to World War I. This is a document that I did not know existed until a week ago. And I'm looking at it, and I'm pretty sure that this is him once I saw the Crestview, Florida thing. And I'm thinking when I show this to my mom, I sent this to my mom. I was like, I think his name was Barlow. But let's go on to the next slide. So this is a clearer version of the actual manifest is, uh, of him being on the boat, being shipped out to World War I. I if you guys can see my mouse cursor, Arlo Reynolds, uh, you can see his uh, military number, you can see his rank, you can see his contact, Niwi Reynolds, and he's listed as his mother. You can see his, uh, his residence, Crestview, Florida. A little bit more research. I was like, what other documents does Fellow 3 have on Barlow Reynolds? This is actually uh, an application for his headstone. He was a veteran. And I, I believe at this point, the U.S. government was, even though it was decades later, the U.S. government uh, provided for his headstone. Uh, and this is his application for headstone or marker. And this has a ton of information on it. And the general question is, is what kind of information could you hope to find from a person's military records? These are great sources of information, date of birth, place of birth, date of death, if the person is deceased at this point, or it's something like a record like this, place of death, service number, enlistment date, grade and branch of military, parents' names, et cetera. There's so much information on this. Uh, just looking at this document uh, gave me chills. I see that uh, the person who signed for it is Ola Reynolds. I see that the actual cemetery place is Spring Hill Cemetery. So this is, in fact, the records for the Barlow Reynolds whose tombstone I saw. These are, in fact, this person's records. But we're going to go one level deeper. And this is general advice that is more relevant now than it was before. I showed you guys how simple these tools are to use, these online tools, rather than having to go through indexes. And the rule still applies for indexes. This rule I'm about to tell you guys. But it's very simple to search for these things, but you have to do it strategically. You have to have some sort of methodology, some sort of strategy when you do these searches. Barto Reynolds. I said, you know what? My mom actually met this man. My mom knew this guy. And if he said his name was Barto. His name was probably Bartow. So I decided to search different variations of the name Barlow, different variations of the name Bartow. Uh, as you can see down here, I have Barlow v. Bartow v. Bartow. I found documents who I'm pretty sure are the exact same person, but the name is spelled differently. The question would be, why is this person's name spelled differently on all of these official documents? It's a thing that happens. Uh, we're going to get into why, I, met, I guess I'll, I'll give you guys a sneak peek. Possibly Barto Barlow might have been illiterate or had vision problems where when he signed up for the military, they said his name was Barlow. And I guess he just went along with it for all those military documents. But everything that's not a military document, it's spelled Barto. So I think the documents I have here, this is from the Social Security Death Index. This card here, the few of the different databases give you access to the Social Security Death Index, but in that, his name is spelled Barto. Also, here is his World War I registration card where he initially entered the military, and his name is spelled Barto here. Another thing that's interesting about this one, I don't know where it is on here, but I'm pretty sure it's on here. Uh, maybe it's on a different document where Nivi or Nui Reynolds is actually uh, Nervy Reynolds, N-E-R-V-I-E, -E, but she pronounced it Nervy, which sometimes got spelled N-E-R-V-Y, which eventually started getting spelled N-I-V-Y. And I knew that this was my relative, my mom's favorite aunt growing up. Her name was Minerva Livingston, a maiden name Reynolds. And that's a family name. That's another thing that comes up in these searches a lot. You might have multiple people who you're like, I'm sure I'm related to these people. And it becomes confusing because it's like, is this the same person? How is this person alive in 1910, but they're also alive in 1965? Sometimes we have names that run throughout families. 
I have multiple Bartow Reynolds in my family, but these are all the same guy. I have multiple Minerva Reynolds and or Livingston and or Baldwin's in my family, but these, these this is the same woman here. Heritage Quest Online, another great resource. Things that you can get from Heritage Quest Online, you can get access to census records, immigration records, public records, uh, social security death index, Freedmen's Bureau, search, and you can do a, a cemetery search. Uh, there's a huge overlap of the services offered by Heritage Quest and Ancestry. Uh, it's just Ancestry has additional tools that you can use to actually organize the information that you find. And Heritage Quest is available at your home. Uh, Ancestry, you'd have to go into the library or buy a subscription to their commercial product to use. Census records are amazing. So the thing about census records is, so now I know that Bar Bar Barlow Reynolds, real name Bartow Reynolds, uh, my mom was right about that. I had to tell her you were correct. So I knew the search for Barlow and Bartow Reynolds and his actual census records came up under Bartow Reynolds. And census records tell you so much information. Uh, the basic information it'll tell you is date of birth, household relatives, some households, if you go far enough back, it even has like a, a person who lives there who's not a relative listed as a part of the family. Presumed race, residents at time of census, occupation at time of census. One of the things we mentioned earlier about the confusion with uh, Mr. Bartow's name, whether it be spelled Bartow or Barlow, uh, at this point, uh, going back uh, 40s, beyond 40s and uh, even further back, actually has, you can't see it here, I'm sorry, it's so small. There's actually a column for, is this person literate? And he's marked as no, not literate. So that sort of explains how the confusion happened with his name. Lots of great information on that. Social Security Death Index. These are great if you go, if you're looking for somebody further back, uh, information like what was that person's Social Security number? Up until recently, you could see uh, property transfers that actually had the person's social security number on it. That's not a thing that happens anymore uh, due to uh, I, the, the, the ease of identity fraud in the modern era. But that's a one sure shot way in older documents or uh, in other places where you go, OK, I have this person's death, uh, social security death index with their social security number on it. And then you're also looking at a property transfer that has that same social security number on it. That can greatly shortcut a lot of searches where you know for a fact that you're looking at the right person. This is one of my favorite tools right here. Uh, it's available through Heritage Quest, but it's also just available as its own standalone website, Find a Grave. It is uh, a database with uh, where different tombstones are cataloged throughout the country. And I was actually able to find the exact uh, tombstone that I was talking about with uh, Mr. Bar Mr. Bartow with his name misspelled on his tombstone. Barlow Reynolds information you can get from a tombstone. His doesn't necessarily have that. This was a government issued tombstone. So it doesn't have a lot of the ornateness, but it serves its purpose. Date of death, date of birth, uh, sometimes people have their spouse's name on their tombstone. Sometimes people have their children's name on their tombstone. Sometimes people have other relatives' names on their tombstone or hobbies that they might have had that could help you identify them. Another thing, especially in Orleans Parish and even more, more specifically in more rural parishes, but you see this in Orleans Parish also in the cemeteries, a lot of times people are buried near their relatives. So while you're there on this website, looking at uh, the different people who were buried in Spring Hill Cemetery, there's a better chance than not that some of these people are related to him. And in this specific cemetery, you'll see a lot of people who are, who do have the last name Reynolds, who do have the last name Livingston, who do have the last name Baldwin. And you could probably just completely jumpstart my whole family tree just from walking around Spring Hill Cemetery in Crestview, Florida. And even a few of the people who have Oddball names are related. Uh, this is actually how I got into uh, this sort of work. Uh, I also am a bit of a cartographer. I, I make maps. Uh, 
And that skill led me into this as a lawyer who makes maps, that skill led me into also doing property research because, and so what we have here, one of the things that are available online, this is also available to a lesser degree in the actual physical branch, uh, Sanborn maps. One of the beauties of uh, having these maps that go throughout time is you can see how a neighborhood builds up, how an area builds up. The maps that I have here, hopefully you guys can see them. I don't know if the people in the house can see them. This is actually a map of where we are right now. This is where we are. This is where we are right now, where you see the 2360. This is what 2360 looked like in 1937. That's when the library, I assume this library was built sometime before 1937. Not this physical one. It was a different, the building's different now, but that's when this library was established around sometime before 1937. But if you go back to 1929, there was nothing here. Right. And so you can get a lot of information. You can get a lot of information for something like that. You can tell like when businesses were established, you can tell who the neighbors were at a certain time. And a lot of times the neighbors are relatives. A lot of times you're looking at documents it might reference next to this person's property or next to this fire station and fire stations, property owners don't last. And with maps like this, you can figure out a lot of stone cold who done. It's a lot of uh, mysteries. So this is a very, very valuable resource, especially in Orleans parish. It's beautiful, literally beautiful. I think that is uh, the end of what I have. One thing that I'd like to tell you guys, uh, specifically if you're elderly or low income, we have a relationship, uh, Louisiana Appleseed, we have a relationship with Southeast Louisiana Legal Services. We also have a relationship with Acadiana Legal Services, and we have grants from the AARP to provide people who are elderly or low income with uh, succession, estate planning, and also wills. Uh, we're definitely looking for anybody who's having issues repairing their home or who's had damage due to a natural disaster and clearing title is an impediment to you repairing your property. We're definitely looking for that. So I'd like to start fielding questions. If anybody in the house has any questions, we can start with you guys. They showed up. So they get to go first. <laughs> uh, there are, even with the elderly uh, grants, for this sort of work, there are uh, income, there's an income cap for people who make over a certain amount. I believe it's, uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna quote it, but I think if you believe that you're in a situation like this, definitely call, if you're in Orleans Parish, definitely call Southeast Louisiana Legal Services and let them be the person who decides whether or not you qualify. And even if you don't qualify, we have other attorneys who are committed to handling these sort of issues at a lower fee than, uh, most of the, like there, there's, there's a real big commitment to this program and helping people be able to get their wills, get their estate planning. And we're very focused on that. So, yeah, ma'am. I have a question regarding the AF property. Um, quite some time ago, there was a property that had a tax sale. Mm -hmm. And we should pay the taxes on it ever since. Uh, but we need to get title to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I am totally at a loss as to how to do that. That's not necessarily an heirs property issue. So the issue we have here is a uh, family bought a piece of property through tax sale and they're actually trying to uh, complete the tax sale. I haven't done a tax sale in a while. But there is a, after, I believe it's a, what is it, three or four years in Orleans Parish? Now, Orleans Parish might be different. The rest of the, the yeah. it's been more than three there, are, there are steps that you have to take. Your, there are steps you have to take to actually get the title changed over, but you should be ready, especially if you've been paying the taxes this whole time. Who does the assessor have listed as the owner of record? Um, Errol is, you know, the local tax assessor. And it's a little complicated well, because my daughter purchased it originally as deceased mm -hmm. and she did not oh. list it under her legal name. 
So this is where the heirs' property issue comes up. Uh, the so the daughter purchased a piece of property in a tax sale. Uh, the redemption period has passed, and now uh, the person in house wants to know how to get the property changed over to the family's name. However, the daughter who purchased the property has passed before they got a chance to move the property over to her name uh, officially into the family. That's going to be, I mean, that's a little bit beyond the scope of what we're doing today. And it's actually a little bit over my head because I've never dealt with the tax sale in this specific situation. You said that there was some attorney Yes. Yes. Southeast, I'm going to give you the information. I should have. I'm gonna, we're going to get it to everybody. We're going to get you guys their information, but you should definitely give them a call about this. Okay. Uh, yeah. And we're going to, we're going to sort you out. We're going to steer you towards a referral for an attorney. Yeah. Thank you. Cause how long has this been going on? Oh, when did you guys I first purchase property? 2019. So for a while. We had purchased this quite some time before that. So All right. it's been a good Eight to ten years. All right. Yeah, we're going to get you sorted. We're going to send you to somebody who can sort you out. Now let's do the questions from the chat. Wow, there's so many questions. So, yeah, um, I, there's a couple of comments. There were some good comments earlier. Um, uh, I know uh, Nika Smith, who I, th I think had to leave, but um, she pointed out that Orleans Parish marriages, some of them are indeed available on family search, mm -hmm. and some statewide marriage records are available on Ancestry. What you can't find there, you order from the Secretary of State, the Louisiana Secretary of State. Um, the next comment, um, yeah, Genealogy Bank, which is the same as our New Orleans newspapers database at the library, has the Times Picayune in the state's item. And then newspapers.com, at least through our subscription, has the Louisiana Weekly for a very brief amount of time, like 1953 to 1968-ish, I believe. Um, we do have a run from 1925 to 2014 on microfilm at the main library, though. So that that is available. I'm not sure if maybe the the personal subscription, the one that you pay for personally to newspaper.com might have a wider range of Louisiana Weekly. I've never been able to, I don't have a paid subscription, so I've never been able to check, you know, but that may be, that sometimes happens between paid and library databases. I know that newspapers.com, our subscription doesn't have quite the range of some of the stuff you get from paying for it every month. Um, Teresa asked, um, how do you access Sanborn maps? And I did put this in um, the chat, but you can access those by going to the library's website and using your library card to access the database portals, which we kind of went over earlier. And then um, this, okay, here, Carol Dotson asks, can there be a family trust for family property? How does that work? Uh, yeah, uh, that is one of the strategies that different families use to jointly own heirs property, but actually have some sort of control mechanism where it's actually spelled out who gets to do what with the property. If we're going to rent it, who gets how much money, who's going to be in control of it. Uh, there are different ways. Some people create trust through their wills. Some people also create trust uh, where they just transfer, they create a trust and they transfer the property to the trust. You'd have to get a, a trust attorney, and these are things that it's definitely an option that people have to keep family, to keep property in the family. But it's basically, normally it's through wills, but it could also be through just creating the trust and then transferring ownership of the property to the trust. Uh, creating the trust is not something I necessarily recommend people do without a lawyer. It's possible. I do not recommend it. I, I I don't believe so. Uh, if it's an if it's an instance, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't believe so. If it's an instance to resolve uh, a piece of heirs property, possibly. But the idea of this is an extinct. This is seems like it's more of a private attorney issue. But I, I I'm not sure. Yeah. So that was the question was um, is this something Southeast Louisiana Legal Services can handle and that. If it, if it is an in, uh, instance to resolve a piece of heirs property that you guys have, I say let's let's give it a try and we'll, we'll all find out together. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Oh, and that's all I got. It yeah. seems like most of these. Does anybody else have any questions they want to type in chat, or do you well, all have any additional, or maybe an additional question or two? Want to? I, I kind of want to pull up the chat so that the people in house can see because uh, there were a lot of uh, different advices and uh, corrections and elaborations on things I said. Yeah. So, like, uh, we talked about Fold 3. Uh, someone wrote in the chat that it's all the U.S. wars. I don't know how much information it's going to have for more modern wars where the information is not declassified. But, yeah, I can believe it. Yeah. Um, uh, what was another one? There was another good one in there that clarified something I said. Hey, man, microfilm is still useful. Everything has not made it to computers yet. Oh, here we've got a new question. I think we've answered everything so far. I, I put that in there about newspapers. Oh, here we've got a new question from Melissa. Um, yes. How soon after receiving an inherited property should the title transfer be made? So if you guys are going through with uh, the succession and different things like that, I would file the succession, uh, the judgment of possession. I would file it immediately. So, and it depends on what you mean by inherit it, because once you inherit it, inherit it, the, the, the actual inheritance happens at the moment that the person is deceased. But then there's additional steps that need to be taken so that you can bring an actual document to the city assessor, to the property records, to actually get that title changed over. I think that you should do it immediately. I, I can't imagine a reason why not to do it immediately. But maybe there is some sort of strategic advantage where somebody might want to hold it. I just, it just, it evades me. So that was fun. I'm really glad that you guys uh, showed up. Uh, hopefully we get to do this again. If there are any topics that you guys would like me to get further down into where we can really just go through it. Uh, I'd like to do that. You can you could, uh, send that to Amanda. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this was a lot of fun. I really appreciate you guys. Thank you guys. Oh, well, we really appreciate you, Jonathan. I, this was excellent. This was a lot of great information. Um, thank you, everyone in the audience, for bearing with us. This was our first hybrid program where we were both doing in-person and um, online. There was obviously a bit of a learning curve at the beginning. I'm sorry, y'all. But we'll get it right next time. I promise. I want to point out the screen. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, yeah, we can. Um, everyone have a good afternoon. Stay dry. Enjoy. And if the weather's nice where you are, enjoy that, too. <laughs>